My son makes fun of me every time I use my GPS. He thinks I should just know where I'm going and not use that. And I've had to explain that. And it's great for going around the synod to perhaps a church or a town I've never been to before. But in terms of where we're going in our culture, GPS is useless. Everything's recalculating. We don't really know where the destinations are. We don't really know all the questions to ask. And that is the tough part. There are all these forces, the economic forces, the political sources, di forces, digital social media, all of these things that are coming together. The fact that there are more generations alive now than there's ever been in history because of extended lifespans and, and the changes between generations are much greater because of the technology and on and on and on. And it's changed how people look at authority. It's changed how they look at faith. It's changed how they participate in things with each other. And we don't know what's going to happen. We just know something is happening. It kind of reminds me of that great uh, prayer that's in the, the evening prayer service in the LBW. And there's just one of those. But, <laughs> and the prayer goes like this. Lord God, you have called your servants to ventures of which we cannot see the end of, by paths as yet untrodden, through perils unknown. Give us faith to go out with good courage, not knowing where we go, but only that your hand is leading us and your love supporting us. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. So my task this morning is to give you some stuff to talk about. So I hope, I hope you like this, but I'm going to give you a quick run through of some indicators of how different it really is for those of us who've been in church culture for a long time and look at the world in a certain way, the environment that many of our non-church, formerly church, anti-church people are living in is very different than what we're used to seeing. So we're going to run through it real quickly. If you would like to get more information, I would love to get a group of folks together from different congregations and go into depth with this if you'd like to do that. Let me know. But here's the, here's the, as we used to say in my day, the single version. Now, you've heard the Gallup poll that says 45% of Americans are in church on Sunday. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that isn't true. Um, in surveys also done by Gallup, one in three Americans of all generations so that they are spiritual but not religious. Now, as the bishop said, that's a good thing. Spirituality is a very good thing. Sometimes people are traditionally spiritual, just not participating in the church. Sometimes they are patching things together that may or may not be particularly helpful for that. What's really interesting is this statistic. When you get to 18 to 29 year olds, it's almost 80% of them who say they're spiritual but not religious. There's a group called Fresh Expressions, and they started in the UK, a uh, project the Church of England started, to try to address the fact that they had all these cathedrals that there weren't people in. And so they've started doing some, some work um, over the years, creating different kinds of expressions of church. But there's a US group that's, done, that's starting up, and that's mostly out in the Baptist and un, undenominational area of the church. But they've done some research and they asked people what was really going on. And they found out that 20% of people say that they participate in church regularly, which by the way in 2012 means monthly or more. But it can be as little as monthly and people consider that regular. Um, about 20% tell the pollsters that they do, but they, they really don't. <laughs> people like, uh, sociologists know that people like to over-report things that people will think look good. Mm -hmm. yes. So there's a number of people who really aren't engaged. 15% of people say that they would, yeah, if somebody invited me, I'd go to church. Now, if you're counting, that's 55%. There's 45% group that tell the pollsters basically that they're just not interested in the package we have to sell. The traditional model of church, whether it's because they've been bored by it, whether they've been hurt by it, whether they're 
just not seeing the relevance is efficient. <laughs> 45% are disinclined to participate in church as we know it. That doesn't mean they're not spiritual. It doesn't mean they're not open to church as we haven't envisioned it yet. It just means that no matter what we do, they're not coming in the doors. So it's an interesting question here to think of where is our target, if you will. Who, are, who, is, who needs us? 20%, 15%, 45%. And how do we how do we balance our efforts? Um, you've probably heard the phrase mainline Christianity. Well, sociologists call us old line now, um, mainly because we're not the mainline. The evangelical church is kind of the new mainline, if there is one, the civil religion of our culture, and they're not necessarily in that here. We talked a little bit about generations. There is some really fascinating work being done on the generations in, uh, and how they're changing. And what I, uh, there's a woman named Carol Shepard who is a consultant for the Diocese of Pennsylvania, the Episcopal Diocese. And she has written a little self-published book um, that addresses some of these questions. And she points out that this is really the first time in history that our churches, our institutions, our governments, our families are dealing with six distinct generational cohorts on the planet. Generally, we think of three groups, elders, active adults, and kids. And that's too simple. There's at least two generations trying to fit themselves into each of those compartments. And they're different, so if you've had conversations at church about why do those people never turn off their phones. Um, you're experiencing some of this uh, generational pull and push and pull. The builders, we all know, the greatest generation, and they were formed by World War II and top-down authority and, uh, and radio, kind of a communal listening experience. Um, you get down to the, the boomers and the late silence were formed by Vietnam, which is a totally different experience. They like to make up the rules. And TV has become a whole different kind of, of broadcast experience, mesmerizing people in front of it, engaging all their senses so they're not interacting with people in the room totally with the TV. The internet came along about 40 years ago, which has made some huge changes between people who are 50 and who are 40. And the Gen Xers are used to surgical wars you know, that don't really affect us here. Um, they just have collateral damage over there. They're connected by the internet. And there's a lot of disillusionment because the economy they were promised, the jobs they were promised didn't really show up. The, um, some of the opportunities that were there, the promise of not really working so hard. <laughs> I don't know. Remember they used to say we're going to have all this leisure time by 2000? Anybody having it? <laughs> Um, the millennial generation, which, which are where my kids are, are um, formed by that, but even more so because they completely, from the womb, have been digital. Mm -hmm. They have been using technology since they could, probably before they could speak, and that's just increasing and increasing and increasing. And then there's another generational shift that happened on 9-11. And anybody born after 9-11 is born into a completely different world. Um, their formational experience is the war on terror. Um, smartphones attached to them at all times. And we don't really know what their communications uh, are, or how they're going to react to some of this because they're not old enough yet. But trust me, it's going to be interesting to watch what they're doing. So in this new digital world, and there is one, um, social media is, is a great influence, but it's not about Facebook, and it's not about Twitter. What's really interesting is for the first time since before printing press, the technology supports the way people naturally communicate. You know, the whole edited, supervised, centralized broadcast, one to many, was not the way people communicated and interacted for most of human history. That's a relatively recent invention. And social media now allows people to form tribes, to be 
connected with people, to leave comments about things they read rather than just read it. Um, and that's something that happened all the time. There are stories of the, the great cathedrals where there are comments basically carved in the wood of the pews or etched in the, the stone. People were doing that marginalia in enlightened manuscripts. There was a conversation going on, and for a long time, we've been in this sleep where communication has been one way. And it's very cool that people are now able to, to act the way they want to do and be part of the conversation. But that does change who the game. For example, in this new world, leadership is distributed. The idea of there being a leader, and only a leader, who is the authority on everything, is pretty much gone. Authority is really situational. Pastors have authority in certain areas, but not in every area of life. Doctors, who used to be, you know, used to sell gum, you know, four out of five doctors recommend. Yeah. Have you seen that lately? Because that doesn't mean anything anymore in this culture. It's also really better in this culture of authenticity to be real and transparent than it is to be right. Because people know, for the most part, that right is a relative term. To begin with. Um, and we were talking about this, I think. Experience trumps commitment. And I don't mean that my cumulative experience in a field trumps my commitment to it. It means if I have a commitment to doing something, but this could be a really good experience, I'm going to go with the experience, not what I've committed to do. How many of you have seen that in any events in your congregation? I don't know how well you can see that picture. I love it. Three people standing together. And they're not all really young, by the way. Um, texting. Each other. I, I don't know if they're texting each other. One of the very cool things um, that, that this technology allows is, and I would encourage you to ask this next time you have a gathering and somebody is, is trying to text or whatever, don't confront them, but, but kind of open the question to, who else is with us? <laughs> Extended by Facebook or by text. <laughs> How is our gathering? You know, it's all network nodes connected. Um, what's really interesting, and I had a conversation at a church related meeting not too long ago, someone who said, you know, I just can't stand that young people always have to have their phones and they're always texting no matter what they're doing. And we, when they come, when my grandkids come to my house, I make them turn the phone off which is cool, which is probably a good thing. But grandma probably has a little more pull than the church does in suggesting <laughs> that, that or, or enforcing that. And there is a reason you might want to be in the room with grandma, even if you don't like the rules. You'll have to ask whether that's the way it's going to work in your congregation. But this, this is a huge generational difference. In a person, linear community that we all love, if we've grown up in the church, and especially if we're over 50, it's what we're used to. It's just simply people under 40, under the digital divide, don't see the point. And it doesn't mean they're right. It means they don't see the point. And so we have to figure out, this is not just having a better program for them. This is thinking about how do we minister, how do we engage people. So I found this on the internet, um, not long ago actually. Um, it's a great, great thing. If when school used to look like rows and rows of desks all pointing at the teachers, and factories were, you know, lines of people, mm. assembly lines or or individual workstations all lined up, church made sense in the presenter and audience model. And says so the school looks more like pods of activity. And work kind of looks, you know, the people are grouped differently and the walls will come down. What should church look like? And that's like a really, I think it's a really interesting question. There are no answers, by the way, which is the great thing because we get to dream. And, no, and, and even though our temptation is to say, no, that's wrong, we don't know. So we need to play a little bit and experiment and dream. I took this a little bit further. Because really, learning looks more like this, and I'm not trying to advertise for the iPad, like Apple would do that, but um, my point is that learning really is very much 
self-directed for a lot of people anymore. It's interactive. It is sometimes on a screen. Um, people have access to more books than are in most university libraries on the internet now, and they don't need to go through anybody to get them. What does that mean? And work looks like, uh, I don't know how well you can see that, the top is a, uh, it's actually a co-working space in Madrid, which kind of looks like the pod office, except individual professional type knowledge workers come there to work, and they work with other people, but not people from their organization. They could be working with people from the competition or from completely different fields. Think of the kind of interactions and cross-pollinations um, that go on in that environment. And the bottom is what one commentator called laptop stan. It is uh, what happens when professionals invade a uh, coffee shop and everybody opens up their laptop and starts working. And a lot of people who work, who fought to work at home, now go work in coffee shops. Yeah, I see some, I see some nods. It's, it's not the mainstream culture, but it's where we're going, and we're going to see more of that. So the question there is, what should church look like? How do we shape it? We heard the bishop and, and Dr. Cray talked about earlier the different things that are going on in the church. And our ELCA is trying some stuff. We have planted churches in, in bars. <laughs> we have planted churches in, um, uh, around kitchen tables. We've planted uh, churches in former homeless shelters. We've planted churches that do, we're trying to do a lot of different things to make church open and accessible to people who are not simply looking for the experience that you or I or our parents value. And this is the, the liminal space. This is the part, the ventures of which we cannot see the ending. How do we be faithful to what we've received and what we know and what we love? Are we faithful to what God's Spirit is doing among us, and yet in a way that will connect with people who don't have the same kind of surface values that we do? These are really important questions that I think we're all going to have to do and ask over the next months and years. So that was the race <coughs> through a lot of material. Um, and I want to turn it back to you. Spend some time at your tables talking about uh, these two questions. Uh, what evidence of change are you seeing in your congregation or in your community around you? And what opportunities do you think they might provide? It's easy to view them as, as threats because they're different, but what opportunities might be there in, in ways that are authentically relate with who you are as a church community? who we are as Lutherans, that we might be able to step into the breach.